America. My name is Ahmed Osei Fimpong. I come to you live every Friday about this time to talk to you about, uh, you know, how to not squander your life and kind of wrestle meaning from it. And I do it from the perspective of a bit of an academic based in Athens, Georgia. And today we're going to talk about the cultural offensive, how to, uh, you know, secure self-determination for black people in these United States. That means it's not just about defense. <laughs> you actually have to go on the offense. There was this great uh, section of a book I saw about two weeks ago where they talked about like you know all these white teachers in black schools and how that was actually a cultural offensive because if you control the black black mind, you control their behinds. And so uh, the idea of integrating school wasn't for a few different reasons wasn't exactly um, uh, pro black necessarily. It was uh, you know pro social control. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the book made the argument that a lot of white women made the argument that they too could be colonizers over black people by, uh, you know, uh, doing the excess labor of also teaching their kids how to grooming them into white supremacy. So, uh, that was just an example of the whites going on offensive of, uh, uh, for blacks. And a lot of what you think of a black Christianity is actually just Christianity that's been processed by white supremacy for black people, like the entire tracks. Um, so uh, the black church has more in common with the white church. It's just the other side of it, where it's like, you know, the white church that go there to learn how the justice of their ruling is uh, sanctified. And in the black church, you learn that well, you're not going to get any justice in heaven, in, in earth. You're just going to have to wait till heaven. And while you're on earth, you just kind of suck it up and deal with the cards you are uh, dealt, not ask for a reshuffle or demand it or throw over, over tables. Like Jesus did. He did throw over some tables. While people call, um, uh, file in, I will say one more thing about Simone. Or maybe a few more things about Simone Viles pulling out. And besides that, no one who is not an elite gymnast knows what goes into making an elite gymnast and like through a competition. So they really should not, us who watch elite gymnasts should just be happy that we get to watch other people do things that we wouldn't <laughs> and shouldn't and couldn't do. Um, so there are a few reasons why people who are poo-pooing her decision should hush. I mean, many of those reasons and then, like, liberals and conservatives screw this up in predictable ways, right? Liberals saying, like, you can't tell her to do anything. She, uh, she should look for her mental health and her self-care is the only thing that matters. That's obviously garbage because there are other people who wanted that spot. And it was a team event, and, and there, are, there are accountability measures. And then conservatives are saying, well, she should go with the – she should do what – she should just fight through the pain and, like, risk her life. Like, you could break your neck. You see what they do? And she does hard things, right? And she was expected to do hard things. She was expected to carry, to do the hardest things insofar as she was, like, expected to carry the U.S. Olympic team. So, um, yeah, the Russian coach said Simone Biles, this is before, a few weeks ago, she said Simone Biles is about 70% of the U.S. team, um, which means that, like, she was expected to do more than she should have had to do anyway. So the idea that she should... Uh, uphold the status quo of uh, playing through pain, or not even playing through pain, just like risking her life for yet another gold medal. First of all, we have a ton of gold medals. Like we, we have a ton of. This wouldn't have been like a historic gold medal. It just would have been another one, like the one we won last year, or last four, or four years, or five years ago now. Um, and she doesn't need another gold medal because she already has five. And, you know, the other girls, if they want another gold medal, like, they, they can hold their own nuts. Um, and, and I think there's a way in which everybody understands this who's actually an elite gymnast. It's other people. <laughs> it's other people who think that she led down the country as if, like, we, the country's safety depends on, on her, like, risking her neck for, for us. So every, even Carrie Struggs, like, yeah. So, like, what are you talking about? Leave her alone. She does things I can't do and could never do. And I was a good vaulter. And uh, she gets to make a decision. So both liberals and conservatives get it right. Liberals say that she had no responsibility to anyone but herself because liberals are bad about institutions and institutional meetings. Conservatives are wrong about saying that she should 
uh, do whatever like upholds the status quo of American dominance and risk whatever because, I don't know, they want to be known as a country who secured yet another gold in women's gymnastics. So Simone Biles should risk her neck for that. Um, I, you know, that's not what... Playing hurt isn't what makes you great. Doing great things when you're healthy makes you great. <laughs> like, it's not, it, it shouldn't be an endurance sport like that. Like, people talk about, well, what about Michael Jordan's flu game? Well, I guess, but Michael Jordan's flu game didn't make Michael Jordan Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, when he was healthy, jumping from the free throw line is what makes Michael Jordan Michael Jordan. Like, I, I, we don't, I don't want to see players play well hurt. I want to see players play well <laughs> at the top of their game. Right? If it's an endurance sport, that's a little bit different, but this isn't an endurance sport. Um, I I don't and like I don't want endurance athletes to play like on sprained stuff. <laughs> um, like I want everything to work and the tapering to work out very well. So uh, that's that's a little bit ridiculous. Um, Plus, I just noticed too many athletes who started out taking pills, like pain medications for like an, an injury in the sport and then ended up like with like real substance abuse problems. It's like a whole genre of substance abuse problems. So that's a whole thing. Um, I did a video on this before about how Simone Biles is not your Negro. So if you want me to talk a little bit more about that, I can go into that. You can go click on that video. But what you should click on, what you should um, watch me now talk about is how conservatives and uh liberals screw up this because liberals don't understand institutions so they think she has no responsibility and conservatives like just run right over insti like like freedom and discretion so they 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 just want her to do what they think like they want her to do they're like that a person who buys a ticket to go see a band and then when the band doesn't play their favorite song like takes it out on the band i don't like i don't know we're just here to go see the show and so who should who is Simone Biles responsible to? She's responsible to the other teammates. And every single elite gymnast has come out and said, like, yeah, she made the total right decision. Gymnasts need that discretion. <laughs> like, like, they would want that discretion if it were them. And so, like, they understand it in her. Elite gymnasts are not, like, she should have, like, they... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so elite gymnasts understand. And you would say, like, well, maybe she owes it to the U.S. Gymnastics Association. Simone Biles does not owe shit to the, and I said that with a heart, to the U.S. Gymnastics Association. She does not owe them, like, <laughs> like they handed her to, like, 18 different predators um, besides the, uh, you know, the abuse that Carolis put her through, um, like, and the NASA sexual abuse, like, and, and she does not owe, so their judgment is disqualified. So the only person she had to clear it through were the other three little girls, uh, young women, uh, on her team, and they are all like, yeah, it's cool, we'll handle it. And... Suni Lee now is the all-around champion. And I think Suni Lee, like, what, she, she, the best thing that happened to Suni Lee was Simone Biles uh, stepping back, which is great for Suni Lee. And I like her. She kind of reminds me of, uh, I know I'm from California and I went to Berkeley, so, like, she re reminds me of, like, the kids I went to college with. I hope she go, ends up at Cal. Like, I, she just kind of, I spent some time in Minnesota and she's from Minnesota. She just seems like a cool, like, I want, like, just seeing her, uh, just kind of handle business. And then uh, I saw there's a show on Peacock called Golden about like a little interviews with the gymnasts. And so I saw her and they're just like, her mean is just cool. She's she's a fine champion and she's a champion. And I, Suni Lee, I'm, I'm about it. Go Suni Lee, go America, go whatever. And thank you, Simone Biles. And thank you. So th thank you, everyone. Um, so, uh, Simone Biles did have some institutional responsibilities to those teammates. And then once she fulfills those institutional, so she had to clear it through those teammates and she should listen to their feedback. And once it's okay with them, everyone else needs to hush. 
right? So it's not the case she doesn't have any um, responsibilities. And it's not the case that she's responsible to everyone. It's the case that she's responsible to these people who haven't, th that, who are invested in the metal, like directly. And then um, once she clears it by them, everyone else just kind of enjoys the show, whatever the show is, right? And if you don't understand that, you don't, you're, you don't understand institutions. So either you expect people to follow the institutional rules, uh, institutional norms, not even rules, institutional norms, regardless of how distorted they are, like the conservatives do, or you expect people to flout the institutional norms w regardless of how justified they are, like liberals do. Um, so you either get crappy marriages or like, like flagrant no-fault divorces, no like healthy like relationship in between. And so this is how they screw up both both those camps screw up like almost all institutions. And it's important because institutions are important for meaning. You can't really get meaning abstracted from institutional relations. So um, you need to actually understand that you don't want to participate in a distorted institution and you don't want to just flout institutions or have that take it or leave it attitude um, uh, that kind of degrades all like meaning making activities, which is why like so many liberals are depressed. Um, good. I hope that's that's clarifying. And like like I said, they this is the same dichotomy that screws up abortion. Um, uh, same dichotomy screws up the way we're talking about marriage. Same, like pretty much any sort of institutional responsibilities. Since we either want to go with a crappy status quo or we want to liberalize it into oblivion, we um, liberalize responsibility into oblivion. We screw up like the proper institutional constraints given this content of this activity and the proper institutional constraints giving that content of that activity for Simone Biles is clearing it with her teammates who then deliberate and it looks like they deliberate came to a decision everyone else should just be happy with whatever decision they came to and I am so uh, now let's talk about how to go offensive against an offensive how to go on the offensive against an offensive culture which is what America right so black people won't be free until um, we change the whites <laughs> um, I, I, like, I don't there's some sort of idea that we can kind of isolate ourselves from them in America that's not gonna happen you can have your little black town but your little black town is gonna be in a white state you can have your little black state but your little st black state is gonna be in a white nation right and insofar as at the national level they control the guns <laughs> and at the local level like and at the state level States control cities. Cities are just chartered from states and like pretty much everywhere in the American South for a reason because they don't want too much local autonomy for you know, anyone who might do justice to black people. right? So you're going to have to deal with the whites. And you're going to have to... And we tried integrating on their terms for a little bit too much of America. Now we need to actually go on the offensive and uh, blacken them up. Um, and so what does that mean, right? So it means taking care of, taking control of public institutions that you can and exerting power through the public shared public institutions, right? In the same way that they take control of public education for us, we can take control of public education for them, which is why the CRT fight is so important. important. It's also the case that there was a book that came out called Reparations. It's uh it's a it's a it's there it is. All right, so I'm getting it right now. Reparations. A Christian call for repentance and repair. Reparations, a Christian call for repentance and repair. That means we get this I say this because this is part of the political campaign for reparations. Except it's Going right at the white church and the in effect and and the the uh, and not infelicities fundamental inadequacies of the white church as it stands. Like there's this great piece that was written by David French, came out last weekend. I'll, I might put it in the description about how everywhere in the Bible justice is intergenerational and historical, and then they use. <laughs> um, uh, you know whatever means are available to figure out what justice looks like. So like you need to use sociology, you need to use economics, and you need to use whatever tools are available. This is in the Bible, um, except like you know they were using whatever uh, uh, understandings were available in order to 
mete out justice, which was understood to be generational. Right? So I don't, like, so this idea that, well, I'm not a slave owner, so I don't owe anything to black people um, uh, is, is, like, unchristian and not particularly biblical. Um, you yeah, need, you, like, freedom is a matter of kind of working on whatever your, whatever cards you're dealt. It's not, you, you, when nobody makes themselves whole cloth. And so y you have to understand that, like, your life is a product of history. And so you have to redress. And other people's lives are a product of history. And, and like, these asymmetries are products of history. So we, you have to redress them. And it's, and you, like, you can find roots of that in the Bible. Right. So, uh, I like, you need a theology that understands that justice is both Christian work and intergenerational. Um, and so that's the David French piece. I'll put it in the description after this video. But this is another book about uh, reparations by um, Duke Kwan and Gregory Thompson. Apparently, it's, it's actually pretty good. But I was just saying, I, I haven't actually, I haven't read it, right? I, I just saw it was being passed around some church circles. And I was like, all right, so this is the right fight. Because if you um, don't fight these non-political battles for a political campaign, what happens is uh, your white allies will say like, well, I agree with you politically, but it's just as a Christian, I just don't think it's my place to. Or, and if you don't actually change the white family, um, they'll say, well, I agree with you politically, but just as a parent, I don't think it's my place to. And if you don't actually change the white conception of property ownership and responsibility, they'll say that like, well, you know, I agree with you as a politically, but as a property owner, I have to do whatever is in the case of what's in the best case of my property values. And if you don't know, like property values will never um, align with <laughs> racial justice, like, right? or like when it will, it, it could just as easily not align with racial justice, and most of the time will not, right? So as long as you have these given conceptions and distorted conceptions of property, church, family, uh, I should, I just shouldn't have to risk my family. Uh, you know, any sort of risk is bad, and so I'll just, you know, pay two hundred thousand dollars to go to this white flight school or, or whatever. So uh, they. Uh, you know, I, mean, I know I'm raising a little Nazi, but it's, 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 or the, some basic <laughs> white kid, but like, I shouldn't have to, I, I feel as a parent, as a white, as a parent, and like the white parents, because all parents aren't white parents. As a parent, I just don't think I should ever have to, um, I should have the right to raise a little white supremacist because it's safer for him and it'll make him happy. But it turns out that it won't make him happy and they'll get de depressed. And now you have like a depressed white supremacist that you don't even like. Um, and but you have to call him your kid because you did that. So you have we have to think about in, like how do we go on the offensive to restructure the white family? Because if you don't, uh, it won't actually uphold. All of these non-political campaigns end up becoming a problem for political justice. Like in California, they had to deal with the Mormons. The the, the gays had to deal with the Mormons, right? So there are all of these uh, measures for. Uh, um, uh, uh, LGBTQ marriage, LGBTQ marriage, and they kept getting defeated by the Mormons in California because there's a pretty, there's a sizable enough um, Mormon population who would be like non-political right up until that question was on the ballot, and then they'd flip a switch and become like a hugely well-funded <laughs> political arm that would just kill the ballot initiative. Um, and so you have to understand that in order to get something like that passed, you're going to have to go on the offensive against the church and kind of degrade the church's uh, sway over those kinds of issues or change their opinion. And, and then um, you'll have your political campaign. So you can't disaggregate the social enabling conditions and the social institutions that are meaning making from the political campaign. Um, so if you're serious about reparations, you need a plan to change the way the white family thinks about provision and protection, because right now, their idea of provision is exploitation. <laughs> How can I extract um, both uh, labor and dignity from black communities and secure it for my family? And their idea of protection is uh, how can I protect <laughs> like what I have from like people who aren't in my family, which is us, right? Which is which is black people, right? So you have to um, 
if you're serious about, and that's just like the gendered male stuff, the gendered female stuff is how can I feel comfortable everywhere I am, no matter what, um, and if I get some sort of guilt about my white privilege, that means I should be able to like, I don't know, get rid of the impetus of my guilt either. You know, this is why a lot of white women have husbands, to kill spiders and kill Negroes. Like, that's, that's their job. <laughs> and the, the, the husband's job. The wife's job is to, like, be a trigger for that, for that impulse. And that's how colonial, settler colonialism and a lot of white supremacy in the United States works and how it's gendered. So you're going to you're gonna have to get rid of that entire uh, gender dynamic within the white family where the guys provide and protect because that provision and protection is uh, based on a racialized exploitation. And white women just can't be held accountable for anything because they're infants, right? So we've infantilized an entire gender for the sake of, like, we've inf we infantilized an entire gender for the sake of protecting and securing, um, uh, like, uh, uh, whiteness from, you know, non-whiteness, right? So that's the more, that's how, like, the morality of, of, like white womanhood has emerged to be as it is. And people say, oh, that's universal. No, it's not. It's, no, it's not. It's pretty much, if you find it in other countries, it's going to be at the highest class <laughs> because they too are trying to use gender to police the lower class and like legitimize how they police the lower class. Right? And, and it's funny because gender advocacy works in other countries too. That way I'm thinking about uh, India in my mind. Uh, insofar as it's mostly a high caste uh, issue where women are fighting for the right to behave like and exploit and ex ex exchange riches as if they were like high caste men. And w meanwhile, the low caste people are like pretty much gender equal uh, for, for most of it. So it's just interesting that you have these non-political factors that need to uphold political justice and racial justice for black Americans. Right. By the way, if you like anything I'm doing, go ahead and kick in five, fifteen, dollars or $50 at www.funkyacademic.com because depending on who you talk to, talking like I am, make myself down quite unemployable. But I think I'm kind of, I'm, I'm saving you from screwing up very important things in your life. So... Go on, show this friend, show this video to your friends about uh, how, like the fight, right? So there's this, and I'll tell you, there's this idea that you could just kind of separate from white people um, and black people will do fine. But that, it doesn't work that way because they still control basic infrastructure. And as the United States gets more, as the modern economy gets more modern, um, and more specialized, it's going to be more internally interdependent. So we actually need, um, like, we can't, there is no space to hide anymore. <laughs> and we actually need those goods. We need the Wi-Fi and all of the, uh, all of the infrastructure in the black communities that all of the, the white communities have. So we actually need to deal with the whites. We just don't have to deal with them on their terms unilaterally. We can deal with them on our terms. Or we can change their terms, which is what I want to do. The cultural offensive. And this is all a skill, right? This isn't something like you're taught. To, this isn't something you come out of the womb knowing how to do. Actually, most black people are taught rather subservience to white supremacy. Low-key subservience. But it still ends up being subservience. Well, you know, it's kind of like the sun. You can't really deal with anything about it. So you just kind of make do no matter what. Whereas I through a few different historical accidents, uh, I think it's a, like just fighting white people is a skill. And we need to actually, and I need to make videos like this to get the skill disseminated amongst the people because it takes, it's a skill and it also takes practice. So you know, I'm not saying you should just kind of like the next obnoxious white lady you, <laughs> you see in a meeting, you should just say, you need to hush. I am saying that might not be the worst thing to practice with. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to hush because I, I, like we shouldn't be determined by your feelings because <laughs> um, those will be weaponized, right? So 
And if you don't go on the offensive, if you don't try to change their church, if you don't try to change the understanding of property ownership, if you don't try to change all of these non-political factors, those factors are going to be weaponized against you um, as political campaigns. Like, like I said, you'll have people say like, well, you know, I'm your political ally about reparations, but, you know, as a property owner, I just can't. Or I'm your political ally about reparations, but, you know, as a man, I just can't. Or as a, I'm a political ally as, um, um, about reparations, but, you know, as a woman, I just have to support blah, 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 blah. And you have to understand that that means we, if we actually are serious about reparations, have to go on the offensive and change their conceptions of what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a parent, what it is to be a Christian, what it is. To, you just go on the offensive. And we have an entry insofar as they think, it's like that, um, it's like that, you know, a lot of people get this sense when they get in a room with me or, or get me in the institution. They think they have me locked in a cage, but they're in a cage with me, right? It's what Rorschach said in, in The Watchmen, right? <laughs> they think they put, like, they think I'm, 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 I'm pent up, but really you're locked in here with me. The university tried me on that too. Um, they tried to get me because they thought I was, they thought I was their board, but it turns out that I could embarrass them because they now were beholden to me. And, um, and I kind of embarrassed them on a, a public stage. So, which is something that I think is good for them. So, you know, you're welcome. University of Georgia. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's just about everything I needed to say. Go on the offensive. You have to go on the offensive um, through shared institutions. I think there should be a white museum of white terrorism all across the United States. Um, uh, I, because like, pretty much in most states you can find, like, sites of white terror that have still affected, it's not just in Tulsa, it's not just in Memphis, it's not just in New Orleans, it's not just in Wilmington, North Carolina, although all of those are known massacres. There are whole towns that are just like submerged under rivers because they like went through a pogrom and killed all the black people and then flooded the town to, to, to kill the evidence, right? So that's, uh, I'm thinking about Forsyth County um, in Georgia, but Or is it? I think Lake Oconee used to be like a, there's a black town under it. So thank you for your time. Um, prepare for the offense. The defensive war isn't enough. We can't just do this by talking to black people. We need to, if you're talking to black people, you're training them to go after the whites um, because the whites are the problem. We're not going to get self-determination pretending that it's just something we can do internally. They control the water. <laughs> right? We have a constitution that's good on property rights, but white people own all the property. They own all the property, but they own a lot of the property. And so the, and the property that we own isn't next to stuff like clean water and roads. So we have to understand that the fight is going to be on white culture and all of its different specifications um, because those specifications now form mutually reinforcing institutions that sustain racial injustice, right? So the white family works with the white church, which works with the, the white media and, excuse me, um, yeah, the white family, which works with the white church, which works with the white media, and which works with the white educational system. All of those work together to sustain racial injustice. And so if we're actually serious about bringing about racial justice, we need to dissemble all of those different factors all of those mutually reinforcing institutions. Thank you for your time. Uh, like I said, if you appreciate what I do, you really should go to www.funkyacademic.com and I will see you next week where I'm going to talk a little bit about constitutionality and why constitutions are a big deal and all of that stuff. Bye. If you appreciate the work I do every week and you think that I should continue to do it because I'm giving you the quality of political knowledge and insight that will help you not squander your life and kind of rescue meaning from it, then go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in five, fifteen, or fifty dollars a month, or make one enormous donations. I like the monthlies because it allows me to budget more and that'll help me, you know, with a marketing budget or getting better equipment that works all the time because a lot of, in a lot of ways, freedom means having equipment that works every time you turn it on. <laughs> and I want to be a free Negro. So, um, if you like what I do, 
go to funkyacademic.com and contribute. Thanks often comes in the form of cash. And the site t- 